my Spanish adventure is nearing its end. It's staggering. And what I've experienced of this country so far has amazed me at every step. My tour began in the northeast of Spain. I got excited in Pamplona. I've got goosebumps. Emotional in Barcelona. It is just unusual, this level of trust, a mad thing that actually means something. It's very, very moving. On the east coast, Valencia tickled my taste buds. I mean, this is like my perfect, perfect afternoon. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Cheers! I was bowled over by Benidorm. That's it. I'm going home. <laughs> in the south, I felt such passion in Granada. That's pretty mind blowing. On the west coast, I tasted history in Jerez. It's delicious. It's gone down the ages very well. Inland, the majesty of Madrid moved me. Wow. What an amazing place. And Salamanca seduced me. What's well, not to like? <laughs> now I've almost come full circle as I reach my final destination, the enigmatic region of Galicia. There's nothing like this anywhere in the world. the northwest tip of the Iberian Peninsula, Galicia feels far removed from the rest of Spain, more akin to Cornwall than Andalusia. With its lush green landscapes and wide, sweeping bays, it's one of the most beautiful but least discovered regions of this country. Here, I'll journey into the heart of Spanish history. I'll unearth the dark corner of Spain's past in the forests of neighboring Castilla y León, before finishing like so many thousands of pilgrims in the ancient city of Santiago de Compostela. But my starting point is a rugged stretch of coast that's home to a little-known prehistoric sea creature. There's more coastline in Galicia than any other region of Spain. You will find rocky headlands and cliffs that cascade down to remote sandy beaches. One stretch is particularly alluring with its haunting and ominous name, the Costa del Morte. Costa de la Morte is a very evocative term. It means coastline of the dead. It's a big Atlantic swell here. People who depend on it for their livelihood do so at their peril. Here, local men and women risk their lives on a daily basis, scouring the storm-bashed sharp rocks for a delicacy known as persebes. This seems like the most inhospitable place on Earth to come to do a day's work. Just walking down here was quite an effort. And now looking at what they're doing down there, it seems actually insane. Persebes, also known as gooseneck barnacles, are sticky little crustaceans that have populated the oceans for millions of years. The ones found in Galicia are the kings of Spanish seafood. At certain times of year in Madrid, you can pay as much as 200 euros for a kilo, which is why women like Mari Carmen take potentially fatal risks in pursuit of their precious bounty. This is a bloody dangerous job to do. There wouldn't be much help if you fell in the water. Don't fancy your chances for long in that sea. On average, five fishermen die every year in these choppy waters. Hats off to her, I have to say. Mari Carmen has been a Persebeira for 30 years, braving the waters five days a week Hola. to collect these primeval-looking sea creatures. This is the Persebeas. They're very strange-looking creatures. What, what is the life cycle of the Persebes? I mean, how do they get here? How do they reproduce? How do they grow? 
Se reproducen ellos mismos. Hombre, es macho y hembra. Sí. Tiene el pene más grande, es el animal que tiene el pene más grande en proporción de su cuerpo, del mundo, ¿eh? That's good. Más grande que el del elefante aún, ¿eh? <laughs> Proportionately, even bigger than an elephant, she says. Sí, en proporción de su cuerpo. How long have these been so prized? Because they weren't always um, such a, such a delicacy. Pues antes era comida de pobres. Yeah. La persona que comía percebe era así como si fuera apartada. Era como si dijéramos lo que sé, ¿no? eh, pues marginales. Y ahora resulta que los marginales eran los ricos porque los pobres no los pueden comer. Sí. So it's really interesting. It's only in the last, you know, 28 years that these have become this, this prized delicacy that they are now. Before that, the sabers were the preserve of the very poor. It's that reversal in fortune for Persebis that has encouraged the women of the Costa del Morte to become Persebera themselves. La mujer aquí en Corne era una señorita. Trabajaban los hombres para las mujeres. Y entonces el hombre cuando venía, el dinero era de él. Entonces él percebe a la mujer cuando empezó a trabajar y tal, le dio una independencia de no depender de nadie, porque ganaba muchísimo dinero. Y antes no era así. Le dio la independencia completamente. ¿Has no pensado en hacer nada más? No. Nunca. Soy jefa, hago lo que quiero, no manda nadie en mí, me siento cuando quiero. Mari Carmen is most definitely her own woman, and her relationship with Persebes is very much a working one. Do you eat them? Yo, en mi vida. ¿Por qué? ¿Why? Why? Niente marisco. Ninguno. Why? Ninguno. ¿Por qué? Porque así no tengo ácido úrico. Great. No, I'm really looking forward to this. But I can't back out now. Having seen how hazardous they were to harvest, I feel duty-bound to try one in the local town of Corme. Gracias. <laughs> Mary Carmen has kindly cooked me up some of these pesebes and slightly apprehensive, I must admit. They're not the most attractive-looking things I've ever seen. But nothing ventured. Con cachelos. Patata con la monda. Traditionally, they are lightly boiled with just a bay leaf and a pinch of salt. Come si come. Si, come si come así, mira. Mmm. Actually, they just taste of the sea. I'm not entirely sure that I would rush to eat these every day of my life. I mean, just how they look is somewhat off-putting. I've probably put worse things in my mouth, though. Hay que acostumbrarse a abrirlos así, para que no te caiga el agua en la cara. Ah, es bueno. Sí, sí, sí. Me gusta. Sí. Mmm. Ah, mira cómo aprendes. Mmm, son very good. Entonces puedes apuntarte en Corme para ir a apañar. Thanks for the offer, but I think I'll pass. Because I'm heading inland the forests of Castilla y León to learn about Spain's darkest secret. Is it shocking to hear that Spain, a country that's in Western Europe, part of the Western world, is only second to Cambodia in terms of how many people are buried in mass graves? I'm leaving behind the Costa del Morte and heading inland to Ponferrada in Castilla y León. Just as surprising as the jagged, harsh coastline, the landscape here is lush, mountainous, and peppered with forests of pine and eucalyptus. If you venture into these dense forests, you'll find flora and fauna and, if you're here at the right time of year, wild mushrooms. So you don't find mushrooms in the summer, obviously. Huh? No, the, uh, the best months are November. November.
Mushroom expert Manuel is a 60-year-old veterinarian who's been mad about mushrooms since he was a young boy. I've met up with him and his son Oscar in a forest just outside Pomferrada. The weather here is very favorable to mushrooms. Hot summers, plenty of rain, and a very humid and damp climate. Come autumn, these forests become a pantry of different species of edible mushrooms. And, as I'm about to learn, some that are not so edible. How many types of mushrooms are there here? And how many are edible? Uh, you can eat like 100 and 120 mushrooms yeah. here. And there, there are like 100 and 1,500. 1,500? Yeah. yeah. So you've got some mushrooms here. Will you just show me? Um, it's Nagaricus santoderma. Yeah. Uh, santoderma significa um, piel amarilla. Yellow Santo. skin. Yeah. Uh, es comibile? No. Uh, no. no. Toxic. 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 What happens if you eat them? Diarrhea. Problemas gástricos. Gastric Nauseas, problems. vomitos. Nausea. Intoxicación. Vomiting, intoxication. How many types are really are the, the ones that are so toxic that they'll kill you? Amanita sí. phalloides is una seta de color verde. Sí. Eh, bueno, me, no sé. me, is that the only one? No, hay más, hay más. Sí, ¿cuánto? Uh, 60, 70, 80 especies diferentes que nos pueden causar la muerte. Si las comemos, okay. no pasa so. nada por tocarlas, no. por olerlas. Sí, o... okay. To my horror, there's up to 80 types of very, very poisonous mushrooms. They might not kill you if you only ate one, you'd be very ill, but if you ate six or seven, you'd be <laughs> done for. <laughs> These forests and this region may conceal an array of mushrooms, but they also harbor a dark secret, a part of Spain's history that would be impossible for me to ignore. It's easy to forget that Spain was in the grip of a fascist dictatorship as recently as 1975. General Franco had oppressed Spain for 36 years. That time saw the deaths of more than 200,000 men and women. Few were afforded a dignified burial. Most were thrown in mass graves strewn across Spain. Since then, Franco and the horrors of his regime have been buried too, erased from memory. All that changed in 2000. Here in the remote village of Priaranza del Bierzo, the site of one of Franco's bloodiest civilian massacres. I've met up with Emilio, a journalist whose grandfather was killed in that massacre. Hi, Emilio. I'm Alex. Thank you so much for meeting with me here. So, tell me about the significance of this place. In this place, during 64 years, uh, there was a mass grave. Yes. With no object to know exactly the place. And in 2000, I arrived here asking the old people of this area. And one of them told me the mass grave, perhaps with the bones of my grandfather, is there, near those trees. I found the place, and a group of archaeologists and forensic doctors opened the grave. I want to identify my grandfather because I want to put the bones of my grandfather with the bones of my grandmother. And now they are both in, in the cemetery of my family. Reuniting his grandparents led Emilio to form the Association for the Recovery of Historical Memory a group dedicated to unearthing mass graves. At the beginning, we say, perhaps we have more and less uh, 40,000 missing people in Spain. Now, now, today, we know uh, 113,000 missing people. It's a little known fact, but Spain is second only to Cambodia as the country with the highest number of disappeared. When the Franco's regime finished in 1975, the people who made our transition are the most of them children of the Franco's regime. And they decide to create this very, very big silence. Thanks to the work of Emilio and his association, that silence has finally been broken. Today, there is a single primary purpose to the association's work, the return of the victims' remains to their families. 
How many people do you think you've helped reunite with their families? We find in, in, those, in the last 15 years, 8,000 people in mass graves. Yeah. We can identify 1,200. I think it's very important uh, to look for these missing people because we cannot leave the people in ditches like animals. We have to look for these people. We give the bones to the relatives, all of them, the old people, arrive the arm of the volunteers and say, now I can die in peace. The association has a nucleus of seven to ten people who work from their small lab in nearby Pomferrada. The process begins with an email from a relative which might inform them about the details of a missing person and where they were possibly buried. Much like detectives, the team research the disappearance. If they have enough evidence, then the dig will begin. The team, aided by volunteers, carefully sift through the earth, searching for clues or scattered bones. All the time watched on by locals and anxious relatives. Nicole is a volunteer who has journeyed all the way from California to work with the association. Can you tell me what's happening here? Um, so what we're doing is we're looking for two men that were um, executed in 1942. I believe they had been um, hiding in the mountains. Uh, so around that time, the, the war had already ended. These men were arrested, they were judged, and then they were executed. So they were really executed. <laughs> yes, yeah. So these two men were supposedly shot near the south wall of the old cemetery, which is this wall here. Yeah. Um, and then buried without any sort of casket. They were just sort of shoved into a pit and forgotten. What set off this particular investigation? One of the family members of the, the missing men, um, the son, wanted to find his father before he died. He's got to be in his late 70s. Is, do families find, does it help them find some kind of peace resolution or some kind of... Yes. I mean, that's yeah. what the process is about. It's closure. It? I think there's a need to bury and mourn the dead. Um, one of the things they say a lot here is to give the families the right to decide how their relatives should be buried as opposed to the people who murdered them. Yeah. Death rituals are important. We crave that, and especially if you're a religious person, to think that that's going to lead to a, a more restful time in heaven or whatever. That's extremely important and it's powerful. <laughs> Below us, the team have unearthed a grim but potentially important discovery. They found the remains of a body. Now they must begin the delicate process of identifying it. This, this particular individual is, is complete. Yeah, so that's, um, they're also, my guess would be, looking to see if there's another body next to it or underneath it because they should be buried together. The problem is that they're looking for very clear evidence that they're dealing with a mass grave rather than just an ordinary burial. When you think about it, it's obvious. When you're exhuming a normal grave, you will find people who are buried in a respectful manner, i.e. with their hands by their sides or their hands crossed on their chest, the traditional positions that the dead are put into. In the mass grave, that is obviously not the case. As the team's resident archaeologist, René oversees the excavations. So can you explain to me some of the challenges of arranging an archaeological dig like this? Pues cuando encontramos los cuerpos, lo primero que tenemos que saber y descubrir son el cráneo y la pelvis. La, esas dos partes de, de los cuerpos nos indican si estamos delante de un cuerpo de un hombre o de una mujer. Son aspectos antropológicos forenses que nos permiten elaborar un perfil de esas personas. Y después, la otra parte más importante es buscar esas evidencias relacionadas con las causas de la muerte, como pueden ser los orificios de bala o también las fracturas en los huesos. Is it a satisfying job to do? Mm -hmm. Sí. La verdad es que la, la mayor gratificación que tiene este trabajo es devolverle a las familias a sus desaparecidos después de, de 80 años donde ni el Estado español ni la justicia han hecho nada por ayudarles. 
it's very important to shine a light on the past, on the historic past, um, because he feels that these people haven't been rendered justice. This corpse will be carefully taken to their lab where they will analyze the remains, forensically examining any physical data to try to prove beyond doubt the identity of the victim. If it is who they were looking for, they will then return the body to his or her family so they can finally rest in peace. Completely blown me away to discover that Spain is only second to Cambodia with the numbers of the disappeared, as they're called here, in mass graves. I mean, I'm sure that almost nobody who you talk to would realize that. Today has opened my eyes to a hidden history here in Spain. But thankfully, not all of this country's past is quite so bleak. It's like dancing. I'm already really, really enjoying this. Yeah. I've headed back into Galicia and north to the port city of A Coruña. Often overlooked by travellers, it's an historic city with fabled beaches, impressive architecture and wonderful food, particularly Pulpa la Galega. I love octopus and Pulpa la Galega is my favourite way to eat it. When it's been boiled in a copper pot in the traditional manner, it's scalded three times and then served on a wooden dish. Very thinly sliced with only three other ingredients, olive oil, salt and paprika. That's the traditional way, and I still think it's the best. This restaurant is reputedly the best place to eat for Pola Galega, and I'm so excited about it. Thank you very much. Oh, yum. Thank you. Mm. Nice. Delicious. Thank you. That is just a heavenly dish. As a port city, A Coruña has always had an abundance of seafood and a strong reliance on the sea. And there's one iconic building that has watched over the ocean here for thousands of years. I'm looking at the Tower of Hercules, which is the oldest functioning lighthouse in the world. It's been guiding ships around this part of the coastline since Roman times, and it's been refurbished many, many times in its wonderful career. It's an impressive structure, but even more impressive to me is the fact that it stood here more or less in this form for over 2,000 years. And here, in particular, you feel a very strong connection with the past. If you have the stamina to climb the steps, the tower has magnificent views of the city and beyond. There's an ancient myth that suggests that Galicians could see north to Ireland from the top of the Hercules Tower. And it's true that there is a real connection between Galicia and Northern Europe. In fact, Galicia is still one of the seven recognized Celtic nations, and the word itself means the land of the Gaelic people. Here, some still believe in Druidry, a Celtic religion connected to nature. Hi. Hi. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Alex. Schwan. Very nice to meet you. Schwan is a Druid very much in tune with his Celtic roots. What you have here in Galicia, we believe, is one of the core territories of Atlantic Celtic culture. As you travel around this region, it's not unusual to come across remnants of its Celtic past. Men here is like these and standing stone formations called dolmens. What are the significance of these stones to you personally? The significance of this stone has to do with the place where we are. And right now we are at the base of a peninsula that's projecting itself into the sea. And that's what's really important because the sea in, uh, in Druidry or in Celtic religion was the, the land of the beyond, the land of the dead. So it's a monument to our ancestors. And then it has some historical significance because you can find this here and then you can go to Ireland or you can go to Cornwall and you find the same thing and you realize that there was a time when we were the same people. 
So does the Celtic connection mean that you feel closer to other parts of the Atlantic fringe than you do to the rest of Spain? Oh, definitely. I mean, the fact that Galicia uh, is part of the Spanish state, it's, uh, it's an historical accident, really, uh, because it was e easier and faster to sail back and forth to the north and the south, like using the Atlantic Ocean, than riding your horse eastwards. If you wanted to take your horse and your chariot to the center of the peninsula, it would take you up to a month. If you wanted to sail to Ireland or go to Wales or go to England or go, you know, it could be a three, four day trip. Yeah. So, you know, for thousands of years, that was like our neighborhood. Do you think the past is more vivid here in Galicia than it is in other parts of Spain? Yeah, the past is alive here, of course it is, because there are things that are around you that you can just change and they shape your culture. It's not only Juan who feels a strong tie with his past. Here they place genuine value on their cultural heritage. Another ancient tradition that Galicians are fighting to preserve is historical martial arts. These men and women are reclaiming the blade from the past. But this isn't fencing or historical reenactment. This is real competitive combat with actual weapons. But it's like such fun. Dennis is a 32-year-old web designer and the head of the group Galicia in Arms. Dennis, I'm Alex. Nice Thank to meet you. <laughs> That's crazy. So tell me about this. What's going on here? Well, what you're uh, seeing is a uh, um, class of uh, historical European martial arts. The basic uh, technique here is to, to defend yourself uh, first and foremost and then to wound your opponent. For, uh, to, to practice that, uh, we pick uh, uh, books uh, which were written uh, in the 14th century, in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. Uh, we are uh, reading those books, putting that into practice and, um, uh, and, and well, uh, bringing it alive again. Dennis has offered to give me a lesson in the art of fighting with a medieval longsword. These are the tools of the trade. OK, good. Right, so this is a longsword, right? Yeah. Um, uh, this is two-handed, mostly. Feels good. I mean, I've never held a sword before. <laughs> so it's... But, you know, I can... <laughs> willing to give anything a go. A long sword, all right? Um, you said that you were right-handed? Yes. Well, you hold it with your dominant hand. Yeah. Uh, uh, near the hilt, this is the crossword, the hilt, all right? And uh, your left uh, feet should be forwards. Right? And from there, right, you are going to uh, punch forward, right? It is always the sword first and the body afterwards. Long swords were in use in the 14th and 15th centuries. These swords are made of solid steel and weigh as much as two kilos. Follow, thrust. Strike, follow, thrust. All right? Yeah. I'm uh, already really, really enjoying this. Unlike fencing, where the main aim is to score points, the objective of historical sword fighting is to get out of a confrontation unharmed. Oh, my gosh. It's like dancing. It's a dance. It's a dance. But it's sword fighting is a dance with someone who doesn't cooperate. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like I've got a lot to learn if I'm to master this ancient art. <laughs> OK. That's it, Beto. It is a growing sport, and I can see why. If you strike, this is perfect. Ah! <laughs> Such fun. Who knew? No. Definitely right up my street. <laughs> <laughs> Just think, the older I get, the more I understand that it's all about passion and about how inspiring people are passionate about the things they do. Oh. You know, what do I know or care about medieval martial arts? But I am completely hooked. In truth, all of Galicia is rich in passion. Nowhere more so than its most treasured city, Santiago. One hour south of A Coruña, Santiago is the spiritual heart of Galicia. 
For over a thousand years, pilgrims have flocked to this magical city, walking the Camino de Santiago, an epic 500-mile hike. It's well worth the effort when they get here. It is a stunning city. Beauty absolutely everywhere. Of all the places that I've been, this is somewhere that immediately, from the moment that you step into one of the squares, feels the most special. Architecture is stunning. A lot is hewn from the same color stone. And there are endless flights of steps and little alleyways. You definitely feel the weight of the centuries here. And this is the last stop on my travels throughout Spain. And it feels like a very fitting place to end my journey. Whilst I'm here in Santiago, I'm going to rest my head in a very historic hotel. The five-star Hostal Reyes des Católicos is thought to be the oldest hotel in Europe. Commissioned by the King of Spain way back in the 15th century as a hostel for Santiago's exhausted pilgrims, it's had various incarnations since. At one time, it was a royal hospital another an orphanage. Now it's a hotel run by manager Julio. I've heard rumors that this is the oldest hotel in Europe, although I believe there's other hotels that may claim that too. We are considered to be one of the oldest hotels, not only in Europe, uh, as well in, in the world. So obviously today is a hostel for everybody, but it started to be a hostel for pregnancy in 1510. It got this function during more than four, four centuries. We can consider that as well as one of the oldest hostels in the world. So considering how important Santiago is and how important this hotel is to the history of Santiago, you must have a lot of important visitors come here. Well, obviously, Santiago is a very special city. And here many personalities, politicians or artists came for special events. I can say that during the, the history of the hotel that many monarchs were staying here in this, our rooms. We, I remember in 99, in the Holy Year, the Rolling Stones were staying here, Charlton Heston, Robert Barner, many at American actors were staying here as well. Uh, obviously, this is one special hotel, and when you decide to do an important summit here in Santiago... This is are, where you come. Are, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Since 1954, the hotel has been one of Spain's state-run paradors, and the many famous names that have stayed here would have no doubt indulged in the local cake of Santiago. Mm. You cannot come to Santiago and not try the Torta de Santiago, which is basically made of almonds. I mean, the ingredients are almonds, eggs, sugar, um, and butter. And this is very popular. This is like nearly like marzipan. It looks delicious. It's very, very rich. Yeah, yeah. For the diet, I don't think it's a good thing, but mm, it's lovely. Do you like it? I absolutely yeah. love it. Yes. This cake has welcomed arriving pilgrims since the Middle Ages. A much needed lift at what is an emotional time as I'm about to find out. Congratulations. I found what I came on. That was very moving. You know, this gentleman said he found what he was looking for. Must be an amazing sense of achievement. It's morning in Santiago de Compostela. And like every other morning, the first wave of pilgrims are arriving in the city. This is their final destination, the last tired steps on the Camino de Santiago, the way of St. James. Many have walked for over a month to get here, an emotional journey across northern Spain. Some are here to honor the Apostle St. James, others on their own spiritual quest. 250,000 pilgrims a year come to this office to get their certificate of distance. To get it, you have to have traveled 100 kilometers on foot or 200 kilometers on horseback or by bicycle. 
to achieve your certificate, you've got to get stamps along the way to prove that you've actually covered that distance. The atmosphere is kind of quite calm, unsurprisingly, as I'm sure that lots of these people are completely exhausted, <laughs> having been walking for 30 or 40 days at a time. <laughs> Must be an amazing sense of achievement. For some, the experience is literally life-changing. Did you like the Camino? Did you enjoy it? Like this morning, one foot was taking me forward, one foot was taking me back. I didn't want to, I wanted to be here, and I didn't want to finish at the same time. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, it was quite hard, quite hard the Camino. Yes, but at the same time, it was fantastic. I found what I came looking for. Congratulations. Thank you. OK. That was very moving. And, um, you know, this gentleman said he found what he was looking for. And I don't know what that is, but that's always a good thing, isn't it? Find what you're looking for. I'm feeling very moved by, by the process, much more than I thought I would be. Pilgrims all naturally congregate in the main square, one of Spain's largest and most impressive plazas. There may well be a lot of backpacks and blisters here, but it's impossible to resist the warm and jubilant atmosphere. There's a lot of celebration, people embracing and shaking hands and high-fiving each other. Whichever bit of the Camino you did, this is the final point. You know you've arrived, you know you've done it. You know, it's a kind of constant scene of celebration. It's lovely. Daniela and her friends have just arrived in Santiago by bike. They've traveled 800 kilometers to get here. You're happy you did it? Mm -hmm. so, much, much, much. Very, very happy that she's done it. It's a jovi que es possível hacer de una manera Este fue la parte más importante para mí. Eh, comprender que se puede hacer de una forma leve, eh, disfrutando todo y con hacer toda la vida despacio. ¿sí? Sí. No, es, no es importante hacer y vivir rápidamente. No. Sí. Disfruta, ve todo. Sea, sea feliz, le digo. Muchas gracias todo el día, por todo. Por comer bien, por amar, por, por tener amigos, familia. Y aquí en el camino, esto, eso se queda más grande, ¿no? Sí. Se queda importante. Todo fica más, se queda más, más bonito. It's so lovely what she just said, which is very kind of emotional and articulate. She's 42 years old, she feels young. But what she's realized is that it's so important just to get space, get time in your life, to have time to enjoy life. And I think that's a, an amazing philosophy. If the pilgrimage teaches you that, then I think everyone should do it. For many of the millions of pilgrims, this journey is primarily a religious one. And the final destination for them is the same today as it has been for a thousand years. This is the cathedral, and it's pretty awe-inspiring. This cathedral is the reason the Camino came into existence. It is here that the relics of St. James the Apostle are believed to lie. The last part of the ritual is to come here and embrace the statue of St. James so that some of his sanctity can be bestowed on you. Pilgrims climb the stairs that lead to an area behind the altar where they queue up to kiss or embrace the statue, wrapping their arms around him in a hug. It's an emotional end to the journey. And as a Catholic, this is all very moving to me. But I want to know why it's still so relevant to so many today. To find out, I'm meeting the Dean in the cathedral's cloisters. 
Bene, perché pensa che così tante persone lo fanno ancora in questo mondo che è così noisy, che c'è così tanto rumore, che è così veloce questo mondo con l'internet, con viaggi, con aerei, con tutto quello? Perché... Questa è la ragione giusta. Eh, la, la persona necessita silenzio, necessita incontrarsi con sí mismo. Y, y en una sociedad como la nuestra, estresada en todos los sentidos, necesita de espacios, de momentos, de encuentros. Y eso se hace en la soledad del corazón, en el diálogo y el encuentro con las otras personas, y que está bellamente expresado en los distintos ritos, en los distintos momentos de la peregrinación. It has become even more important for human beings to encounter silence and to encounter themselves. And he says it's like a therapy and it's more needed than ever in our world of today. The final flourish for many of the pilgrims is mass in the cathedral, a very special experience in more ways than one. The Botafumero is a giant vessel full of burning incense and red hot charcoal which has been in use in the cathedral since the Middle Ages. Its original use was to clean the air of the pungent odor of unwashed pilgrims. Since then, it has taken on a religious significance. It takes eight men called tiraboleros and a system of antique pulleys and huge ropes to propel the Botafumeiro. 75 kilos of silver-plated brass swings like an enormous pendulum above our heads, wafting incense as it arches through the air at speeds in excess of 68 kilometers per hour. I'd be lying if I said you feel completely safe. I've never seen anything like that. It was completely mad. That enormous sensor swinging wildly over everyone's heads. Probably a fitting end to this amazing journey throughout Spain that I've enjoyed so much every minute of. I've been surprised and amazed by so many things here, even the places that I thought were obvious tourist spots. I can't pick out one place because I've loved it all, every single minute of this trip. I'm glad I'm ending it here, though.